Well, thank you all for coming. Um, small little intimate turnout. <laughs> um, but for those of you all who haven't met, I'm Olivia and I'm the Opioid Overdose Rescue Box Program co Coordinator um, and also Mayor Parvista. And we are here tonight um, in response um, basically to a Nalox Box project. I'm kind of going off script a little bit. Um, Don't do this. But, <laughs> talk to them, but like, we don't have a massage or anything. But um, we are working to get these Nalox boxes installed throughout central Vermont. Um, they already in exist in a couple locations in Vermont, um, but they would be the first in central Vermont here. And um, we put out a pre survey to the community to gauge. Um, their interests, their questions about overdose, their questions about Narcan, um, received a lot of feedback that people wanted more information, wanted more education around Narcan, um, which is what the start of these trainings are about. There's a series of three, so we have two more in Barrie and Montpelier. Um, and so we teamed up with Vermont Cares, which is Teresa over here, so I'm sure you all know, and um, they were going to do a little Narcan training. And then I was going to just talk a little bit more about the project. Um, and yeah, that's like a little intro to why we're here. But thank you all for coming. Um, and so I don't know what the best way to kind of go about if we want to just like have a conversation about, um, you know, our experiences and you guys being out here tonight. Or um, like you said, Teresa, I don't necessarily want to like preach the choir like we all are here for the same reason, but um, yeah. <laughs> I guess I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so my piece of this was going to be to share like um, with community members who might not know how to recognize the signs of overdose or how to use Narcan and that kind of thing. But I, I know that you all know how to use Narcan. I don't need to do that. I believe that probably most of the people on the Zoom, I'm not sure. I just want to find out what folks need, because I don't want to do a, a Narcan demonstration for folks that know how to use Narcan. And I'd love to, for me, I I told Olivia and Eva and Javed, I have um also a, a, a story that I wanted to be able to share this evening after I talked a little bit about how to use Narcan. Um, and also, we've done a lot of community events where we've had really intimate groups like this. And a lot of times we've turned them into really amazing, rich deep conversations that we could really still get some really awesome work done. Um, but here's a smaller intimate group. And so I'm here to support you all and whatever you need, answer questions you might have, talk about resources. Um, so that's kind of, that's me. I'm, oh, and I'm the executive director of Vermont Cares. So. Why don't you share your story? Yeah. Are you open yeah. with the story? I okay. think that's really important. Hi there. Hi. 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 Welcome. Like we'll sit with us. I'm here to get some photos around the back. Oh, great. Okay. Anything we need to do or not do, just do what you're doing. Make sure you're looking for this. Oh, God. I see babies all over me. I guess I probably should at least share a little bit about who I am and who Vermont Cares is for folks that may not know. Um, that would be helpful probably also for folks on on um, on Zoom here. So Vermont Cares is um, one, we're a part of the CDPC coalition, um, but we also are a statewide nonprofit organization uh, that does um, HIV prevention and care and harm reduction. So we operate um, syringe service programs around the state, uh, one in Barrie. Uh, one in St. Johnsbury, one in Rutland, and then we have two mobile vans. So we have a pretty expansive program across 11 counties. Um, I have been the executive director for just over a year, but I've worked for Vermont Cares for 11 years. Um, I started at Vermont Cares as a case manager, uh, working with people who are living with HIV. Um, and sort of made my way up through the ranks um, to uh, to the executive director position. And I think the reason that I've stayed in and been so committed to this work is um, one, I'm a person um, who has recovered from really life-threatening chaotic, chaotic um, drug use. Um, and I've always wanted to be able to help other people. Um, and recently um, I've had a renewed, a renewed um, sense of urgency um, to the work that we're all doing. And for the reason that we're all here is so important. We're here to learn how to save lives right? The work that we all do with harm reduction 
in your fields, um, emergency service providers, medical providers, we all are here to, to save lives and to help people. Um, and I live and breathe this, right? And um, I recently was in a situation at a a, a, a little bar restaurant um, for an event and with my family and um, someone experienced an overdose while I was there in the dining room. The worst thing ever I could ever imagine happened and that was I didn't have Narcan on me. Me, the person who talks about this every day, who has devoted the last decade of my life to this and, and genuinely really believe that everybody should have Narcan and access to Narcan and I didn't have it. I do this work every day. I talk about this every day. It's around me all the time. I left home without it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I, I really wanted to speak to people here tonight and say, I get it. Like, why would someone who doesn't do this and doesn't know anything about it has been impacted by it also be like, gosh, I need to have that medication on me at all times. New perspective. Um, I then decided to just say, oh my goodness, I wonder how many of my staff, you know, who we also all do this work, uh, is everyone carrying Narcan and, and um, ask the staff days later and only one person had been carrying Narcan on them because we became complacent about, mm -hmm. about this and, and it's not going to happen to us e even in this field. Um, what happened in that moment for me was there was a lot of people in this in this building and not one person had Narcan and people were screaming, does anybody have Narcan? Please somebody get Narcan. And I just, I kept looking through my purse even though I knew I didn't have it. And I just kept like dumping it out and I knew I didn't have it and I felt so helpless and also so, so upset. It was super traumatic, like, like probably nothing I've ever experienced before. And I realized then, and I've done a lot of these trainings and a lot of times community members, especially will say, I don't know about that. I'm nervous. What if I don't use it right? What if, what if I get too close to this person? You know, they're nervous. They're, they're scared. I don't blame them, especially in a scenario where you may not know the person. And I realized in this moment when I went through this experience that it didn't matter if you knew how to use Narcan if, if, at all. If you just had it on your person and were able to give it to the, to the people who were trying to help save this person's life, that's all you needed. And that feeling of helplessness when I knew I had a way that I could have helped in a different way um, will live with me for a very, very long time. But I'm using this as a way to to really implore people to consider what it means just to carry it, even if you don't know how to use it. Um, if you're nervous, to maybe, you know, you hear different, there's all kinds of myths and stories about people when after they receive Narcan, maybe they're going to come out and be violent and come out swinging and, you know, all of these different things or, oh, you get too close, you might breathe in some fentanyl and overdose yourself. These are things that aren't true, but there's still things that are circulating out there in our communities and in our world. And they, and of course, people are fearful. Um, and I just want to say, you don't have to be scared to carry Narcan. You can save a life. Um, and and I'd rather have you be a little nervous to carry Narcan on your person than have to experience um, watching somebody die in front of you. I'm gonna pause now. Um, I've been waiting I, to be able to talk about this without crying and without breaking down. Um, I appreciate you all. This is the first time I've told this story publicly, um, being very broad about it to protect people's privacy um, and just renewed a renewed urgency for me um, also. Um, not that it ever went away, but um, just a different perspective to have. Uh, we talk about the signs of overdose pretty nonchalantly. Actually, I realized I didn't realize how nonchalantly until experiencing it firsthand. Um, and I can almost, almost, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the reason we're here tonight and we're going to be in other places is that, you know, we need to have, you know, this is a life-saving drug. 
But if it's not there, it doesn't save anyone's life. And we need to get it into the hands of people, not only that use drugs, people that are with people that use drugs, family members of people that use drugs, and the general public, because all it takes is one of these things to be there. And you're right, no one, you don't have to give it up in that carnival. There are plenty of people that can and will. Yeah. But it has to be there. Yeah. You know, and that that's such a powerful story. And, and I'm sorry to be with you. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to bring some good from that. We're going to bring some good from that. That's right. And uh, super important. Yes. Yes. And, and I would like to say also the, you know, uh, when EMS came, they did such a great job, um, you know, and, and that felt really good too, um, to, to see uh, the, that interaction happen in this particular place in a really kind and compassionate way. Um, so that was good too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what I guess I'm bringing <laughs> back over to you, Olivia. I don't... No, thank you for sharing that again. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I could I could talk more about the project. Why don't we go like... the slides? Sure. That'd be yeah, sort of a, a good place to start. I'd, I'd love to see. It. Sure. Okay. Do you want me to share it with you? Yeah, that would be great. I want to have one of these in every single business across the state. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, your, your story reminded me very much of probably the first person who ran into someone who coded in a public setting who, you know, maybe had seen a CPR course or had heard about CPR, but, you know, everyone around him is nervous to do it or yeah. you need an AED, someone please get an AED, you know, and I mean, it sounds like we're working on something that will be similar to that which yeah. in turn will, I think, you know, down the road, we'll find that similar to the AEDs, we're going to find people who are going to, we're going to be saving lives by implementing these. So yeah. maybe that segues into yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your yeah. thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So that's a perfect thing. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you have someone Mm -hmm. Let's go through these slides and then mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. assess where we're at. Okay, you can go to the next one. So I wanted to start with this graph. Um which is showing opioid related deaths over the past 10 years in the state of Vermont. So it's a statewide graph, but it's pretty um jarring, just the drastic increase over the past 10 years. Um 2019, there was a little dip, but then it went right back up in 2020 due to the pandemic. And in 2021, there was 217 opioid related deaths. Um, and we don't have the data yet from 2022, but they are set to surpass these numbers. And I just thought this was just a good visual for everyone to just really understand that it is an increasing issue um, for sure. And it's not going away. <laughs> Um, getting Narcan. So we actually have Narcan here for everyone, um, in person tonight who would like to take some. Um, but these are also locations that, um, you should be able to get Narcan from, um, in there, there's other organizations or let me backtrack. <laughs> there should be, um, places where you can get personal Narcan. This is where you should be able to go and get those. Um, there are other businesses and organizations that will have Narcan, such as like a nurse's office in a school, having it behind a desk, things like that. But there are isn't a broad system in place to have personal Narcan. Um, and this is why it's so important to know where you can get it. Um, and I know we had a brief conversation tonight about um, pharmacies and being able to get Narcan at pharmacies. I don't know if you wanted to... Mm -hmm. Say something about that, Mateen. Or oh my gosh, Teresa. That's okay. okay. I'm Teresa sitting Teller. in for Matina tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> I was very happy to be asked to to come. It's been a while since I got to come out in the community. Um, so yes, pharmacies. Um, this is a little, you know, it's been a standing order for a very long time that you could go to a pharmacy without a prescription to get Narcan. And way back when this first came out, I know there was some secret shopper um stuff done around that to see how how were people, you know. How were they really met at the pharmacy with these requests? Um, 
And I know that even had maybe done some of her own as well prior to this. And I think it's been a real mixed bag. Um, and I like to be pretty straightforward in the secret shopping that we've done and that we've heard of other people do. Um, it's been difficult to actually get Narcan at a pharmacy. Um, we've heard of pharmacists charging up to $295 for a single box of Narcan um, in one of our secret shopper experiences. Another one charged the exact price, $75, exactly what it was. But then also like the attitudes um, have been different towards how you're treated when when you when you go in and ask for something. It's extremely similar to the um, to the law of uh, syringes being able to be purchased without a, a, a prescription also from a pharmacist, but it's pharmacist choice. They can charge you what they want. They can say yes, and they can treat you any way that they want. So just for people that are considering doing that without a prescription, just to know that you may be met with with a surprise, you might be surprised at at how you're how you're met. And this isn't across the board by any means. I don't want to stereotype pharmacies or pharmacists um, for treating people poorly. That's not what I'm doing. I just want to be really honest about what could happen. Um, and you also may just go into a pharmacy and they immediately have that in stock. A lot of pharmacies are saying they don't have it in stock or, you know, that just making it a little harder than it needs to be um, to access that day then. Um, and we know that there is a, a law that requires um, you to receive a, a partner prescription for Narcan if you're prescribed um, pain, pain, opioid pain medications. Um, and I believe that those prescriptions, the feedback I've heard on those, it's been much easier if you go with the prescription because you're also picking up your um, prescription from the farm from the from your physician. Those folks haven't had as many barriers in getting the Narcan. Um, and this is some old stuff too from years ago, some newer stuff. Um, but I try to just be as 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 straightforward with people as possible. And Eve, I like to. I know you mentioned maybe you brought the standing order here, so if people needed it. Um, sometimes it's nice uh, to have that with you. So in case the pharmacist is unaware of the of the law or the rule um, that, you know, you can provide that to them. But yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that helps. No, that's very good to know. Um, yeah, I'm glad you shared that about the pharmacies for sure. Thank you. And yeah, I can go to the next slide. Um, so the Noxbox project um, timeline. So I wanted to just give you all a little overview of what has been going on over the past couple of years. So in 2020, 31% of the overdoses that happened in the state of Vermont happened outside of the home. Um, and you also saw from the past slide, just the drastic increase of overdoses in the state in general. Um, so due to this is why a work group formed and um, our work group consists of partners um, from the Barry Fire Department, um, Barry Police Department, Vermont Cares, um, the Me Vermont Medical Center, EMS, and many others. Um, and they, they have worked with us to try to increase access of Narcan to bystanders um, and hopefully save lives. Um, we learned about Nalox boxes and thought that this could be a great initiative, but we wanted to check in with the community and that is why we conducted in the fall of November 2022, we conducted a survey um, and the survey results were um, we were able to create goals and understand the community a little bit more. And it sounded like a lot of people really were eager to get more education surrounding naloxone and overdose. Um, so that is partially why we're here tonight, um, or mainly why we're here tonight. We have a series of three, um, trainings. There's one more in Montpelier on Monday and then, um, April 11th in Barrie. Um, and we hope to, um, launch off of those from installing some, um, pilot locations for our Nalox boxes. Usually they're going to be like at some of our partner locations and and then broader installation around central Vermont is the goal. <clears throat> yes. Okay. And so as you saw in the timeline in November, we did a survey and these are just some 
um, highlights that we wanted to touch upon that this survey brought us. Um, so 248 people were able to complete the survey and um, we were able to reach people from Barry, Montpelier, Waterbury, Mad River Valley, Plainfield, Marshfield, and East Montpelier. So there was um, a wide range of people who were able to answer. Um, 76 people agree that having Narcan available in public places will help their community. Um, 63 said they were not sure how to administer Narcan in the event of an overdose. And then 53% said that they um, do not know if they know the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose. Um, and yeah, these are just some statistics that we thought were interesting from the survey and why we're here. Yeah, can I add to this? Really Please quickly? do, yeah. So I think what's really heartening here is that the vast majority of people who took the survey feel like Narcan would benefit their communities because it's much easier to provide training and education than it is to sometimes change people's minds about what they think is, you know, a good or right idea. Um, the reason that we're sort of taking this methodical approach to the No Last Box project is that we're um, working with some partners who were part of the Barry Sharps project many years ago. Uh, and, <laughs> and I heard you came up with the logo, which is so nice. Um, and so uh, that project has a really nice toolkit that you can use to do exactly what we're doing now. And one of the things I think that happened that's a little bit different that happened then is that there was more community resistance to the idea of sharps boxes going up and so we spoke with you know joan reeve and the health department and she said i'd really like it if you kind of did this sort of slower methodical public health approach um and so anyway my point is that that's really heartening because we can work with that i can work with 76 percent of people thinking that publicly available narcan is a good idea um uh, so thanks for letting me yeah. chime in there. Yeah. Yeah. I tell a quick story. Please do. Recognizing the signs of overdose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on that data point, it was just, and I actually was just telling Eva and Olivia this story earlier, but the 53% of people that didn't know how to recognize the signs of, of an overdose um, reminded me of another um, story that I'd heard many, many years ago at a training in Mount Holly. And um and someone had gotten, and this ties back to the pharmacy, Narcan, uh, had had a, a family member who uh, they were concerned about. So they went to the pharmacy and got Narcan um, through the pharmacy, but they didn't know anything about Narcan. They didn't know how to use it. They also didn't know how to recognize the signs of overdose. Um, their son uh, was overdosing, but they didn't recognize the signs because no one had told them what to look for. And unfortunately, he died while they were had the Narcan out in the package, but didn't know if they should use it and weren't sure how or when to. And that story also has stayed with me this all of these years and how sad that was that just a little bit of education um, could have saved saved a life. And um, they were ready to carry that. Um, so, yeah. The other statistic that's not on here that's important is about 75% of respondents didn't know where to access Narcan in their communities. We should probably have that on here. It was, that's mm -hmm. a really important part, uh, piece of um, that previous slide and also this concept behind the last boxes. Do you all recall if there was a what which communities of respondents sort of felt this way? Do you see differences, if you recall, um, in Montpelier versus Waterbury, or anything? Might have been um, <laughs> Yeah, I we didn't separate. I was gonna say I don't think okay. I don't think people said where they were. Gotcha. Yeah, what town they're from? Yeah, it was that we we made a conscious decision actually, and the the survey was five questions. It was those four questions, and then do you want to tell us anything else? Mm -hmm. And we had to decide, are we going to ask more questions about where you live and what's your zip code mm -hmm. or, you know, some demographic information? And we decided not to. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might be partly why we got such a good response. Mm -hmm. The public health data expert in me wishes so much. That mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So inside of a Nalox box, um, there is a rescue breathing kit and a um, container of Narcan. Um, as you can see, it, it's right next to a, um AED, but they resemble an AED box um, and other first aid kits. And um, they provide quick access to Narcan in the event of an opioid overdose. And yeah, I I know, Eva, you mentioned this to me, and I also agree. Like, I really like this picture and just the sense where it's right next to an AED and it just shows how it's like very much just, it's just as important, just as easy to install, can be right there, just like an AED is in every restaurant you go to, pretty much every building you're in. Um, there really isn't any reason it can't also be there. So, one thing that's nice about co locating them too is that my impression is that is it fire has to knows where AEDs are mm -hmm. installed. Um, and so I think that this is a, a nice pairing. It could be with a fire extinguisher or, you know, other sort of emergency um, supplies. Mm -hmm. One thing I just want to point out here is that in this picture, this box has has an alarm here not all boxes have an alarm but in mm -hmm. this case if this box was open it would trigger the alarm and it would sound um just you know that's sort of an emergency signal but the boxes that we have don't have that and sometimes people point that out and wonder what the difference is and that's what it is Can I point out one more thing? Yeah, please do. <laughs> this kit has one box of Narcan in it. I have seen pictures of communities that stuff it full of Narcan so that you don't have to worry about one you know, mm -hmm. dose or two doses being gone and, and taken from it. So um, there are different ways to do that. Yeah, so Nox boxes are actually installed all over the country. Um, and there's two locations, I believe two, um, that already have them in Vermont, and that is White River Junction and then the GE Aviation Facility in Rutland. Um, and, and our project would be the first to bring them to central Vermont. And it really is just um, a community-based solution for what we have discussed is like a nationwide epidemic. And um, we really think that if we treat this would be a way to really um, educate and, and allow bystanders to save lives and really make a difference. So, that's it. <laughs> On that last slide, I mean, that's all there are in the whole US? Mm -hmm. Really? Wow. I mean, well, that's. Mm -hmm. There's actually a website, their website, you can like. If you see one that's not on that map, you like type in where you saw it and it's kind of like, I think a self um, required hmm. types, but that is, oh. yeah. I have a question, Eva. Mm -hmm. How can uh, you obtain uh, one of these outside of, outside of the Central Vermont project? Um, can anybody um, purchase or obtain these boxes? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so you can go to www.nalockbox. <laughs> I don't know. They have a website. So, so it's super yeah. um, attainable. It's to anyone, I, I'm under the impression that anyone can order Nalox boxes. We get them from the UVM Center on Rural Addiction. Okay. Um, they cost a couple hundred dollars. Um, and they do not come stocked with Narcan. So you and your community need to figure out how you will stock them, monitor them. Yeah. This is really great. Uh, really, really great to know. Um, I will, I, we will be purchasing some of these to put out in non-central Vermont areas. I think it's just really, really, um, it's a really such a great, easy way to, like you said, to get this out there for people um, who, who aren't carrying it. And I, and I think, cause we are, are all going to maybe forget to carry it on our person every now and again. And um, really awesome. Thank you all so much for your hard work on this project. It's really awesome. Yeah. We're excited for the sort of pilot installations, and then that will help us work through some of the processes and how do we, how often do we want to check them and how often are we checking in and that kind of thing. And, um, and then 
the next step will be putting them up and trying to make sure that the installation locations are data driven so that they're really making a difference, but also finding where there's readiness with partners to install them. So um, there's a little bit of a balance there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this whole kit is amazing. I mean, after hearing your story, I'm just thinking about, you know, myself, like being an off-duty EMT in my community. You know, I mean, there are so many times, like, when I leave work, I'm not carrying a first hand bag with me. You know, like, I'm in plain clothes. I leave my car. I'm going to the ice center. If someone goes down in front of me, I can most likely rely on an AED. But if it's not a cardiac arrest and it's an overdose, I'm not carrying Narcan on me. You know, that's, that's on my work truck. Like, that's on my ambulance, you know, so... And in seconds count, you know, if someone is not breathing, they only have a few minutes until they start, you know, declining to the point where it's it's very severe for their their health. So the stuff really matters. And, you know, you, you kind of touched on it. Like people have a negative look on Narcan. Some people have a negative look on Narcan. And it's hard to change their minds. But I have to imagine that there are people with the same you know, outlook on people who need an AED, you know, people who maybe are overweight and, you know, didn't take care of themselves. If they collapse, it's like, well, at what point did they do it to themselves? I mean, that's not fair. That's not our Accurate. judgment. You know, it's it's our job. It's our job as people to help our community. I mean, if someone drops in front of me, I, I became an EMT because I care about my community and I want to help, you know, the people that I've grown up around and I want to give you know, my helping hand out to my community. And it, it doesn't matter what I'm using. People all have their own things. So it's my job to help and these are gonna do a great job. So if you wanted to have a kit yourself, would, would he just be like any other person to get a kit or would EMTs be able to get, be provided a kit if, when they're off duty? So the intention is that it's installed on the wall somewhere. So if there was a place that it would be important for it to be installed, we could definitely work with you to to make that happen. And then maybe we could talk about, you know, one of the really important pieces is how do we make sure that it's still, it's always has Narcan in it. Cause the worst case scenario is that somebody goes to use it and it's empty. Mm -hmm. So like my, like what we're constantly thinking about and it's going to be different i think with 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 every place that it's installed is we have to have a really clear understanding of whose responsibility is it to check this and how often and do they know how to receive more narcan and where does that narcan come from so that's why we're starting with two places we know very well we're going to go with turning point center of central vermont and then the foundation house which is a new recovery residence opening in barry for women and women with children so we'll start there and then sort of see how that goes before we go to, you know, broader. I wonder if you, I mean, if you could figure out where there are AEDs around. I mean, I'm sure, you know, and that, that might be, a, maybe you guys have already thought of this, but like a starting point of people who are, or organizations like schools, like that are willing to put up, have AEDs there. Yeah. Uh, maybe that would be a good you know, that might be organizations who have a disposition uh, to be public spirited in that way and might be willing to consider it. Yes, that was, it's that's exactly kind of our thought process. And initially, I think Rachel and I wrote a letter like over a year ago, because we were like, let's get in, in every school in central Vermont. That's like what we wanted to start <laughs> with. Uh, and we thought, oh, we'll just, they'll, that's exactly what we'll do. We'll put it next to the AD. And then that's when we thought, okay, if we did this and parents said, why are you doing this? The project could die. Right. And we said, we got to do the survey and see where the community's at. Now I know the community wants this. So now we can start, start doing it. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, was, I mean, for schools, the school boards might be a good place to start. You know, and yeah. It, you know, it'd be interesting to see how, how, how people respond to it. But, um, the other thing is I feel like having these things around, and this is, a, in my mind, an argument for having them in schools is that, and even just having them there raises awareness, right? right. Like people are like, right. oh, what's that thing? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is really, this is important enough that we're putting things all over the place, right? Yeah. Not only raise awareness, 
and also Olivia just sort of said this quietly, but starts to work on the stigma issue yeah, by, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I think when it becomes a normalized piece of equipment like an AED, and when it's positioned right next to an AED, which most people recognize now, they see that lightning bolt, they know what it means. Right. But, um, it goes a long way to sort of making people aware that it, it serves the same purpose, right? For a, a different disease. Right. Mm -hmm. We did in that survey have some misconceptions in the sort of open response. Mm -hmm. People expressed some concerns um, that will, um, we have a, we made a handout to address them. Um, but some of them included people, you know, being concerned that you could use Narcan to get high. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one that we that we have on the sheet that this really has one purpose and it can't be used in that way. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think those are, those are the kinds, in addition to the general awareness of what are the signs and symptoms of an overdose and how to use Narcan, I think there are some other important things that we still need to do education on. And just getting these out into the community. I mean, it, it's similar again, not to, you know, beat a dead horse here, but, you know, same with the AED. I mean, if you start putting those out in public places and people start realizing like, oh, I know this is here. I have no idea how to use it. Then there will be a group of people who are also like, well, I see these boxes, overdose emergency kits. I don't know how to use it. Eventually there will be people requesting trainings, on it, you know, right. and my, my hope is to see these go out in the public, have people have questions and, you know, spike their curiosity. And they get to the point where, you know, having CPR trainings in the community is, I mean, we're having these like right beside them. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. okay. That would be the hope. Well, at this point of the night, we were going, we had a pre-post assessment that we didn't do, but we were going to transition into like an open questions and answers section. Um, and I didn't know if, Javid, if you had any words that you wanted to say or if you already did, but. Um, uh, oh, so um, I'm Javid Meshkuri. I'm the, I work at Central Mount Medical Center Emergency Department. This is Dr. Ben Smith. He's the director of our emergency department. Um, and we're both proponents of low barrier access to, to care. And care can mean a lot of different things. It can mean saving someone's life with Narcan. It can mean having treatment available for people to seek treatment. But most importantly, I think we both share the belief in that you know we need to we need to be there for people to address what they want to do with their lives. And we're there to help them. And we have a lot of things that we can do to help them. Um, and what I like about Narcan is that, you know, it sort of signifies the rule of people taking care of themselves when they have, when they use drugs. And the first rule of getting help when you use drugs is what? Being alive. alive. You've got to be alive or you can't get better or get help. So that's a really powerful piece. And, um, you know, and I think the simple things for the public are, you know, how do you prevent Overdose is some real simple things. You know, we want people to avoid using alone, right? Because then people don't know you're using, can't get help. There's actually a um, neverusealone.com. It's a, it's a helpline that's got, you can go online or you, there's a number too, 800-484-3731, where if you have the need to use and you're alone, someone stays on the line with you. They know where you are and they can call for help. Um, you know, Sterile syringe programs are so important uh, for people to have the right, you know, healthy to stay healthy while they if they're going to use they need they need the right stuff. Um, you know, H hepatitis C, HIV, endocarditis are really significant problems for people who use drugs, and we need to protect people so that doesn't happen. Um, and then things like this fent fentanyl test strips. You know, most people still don't think they're using fentanyl and we know what the what the makeup of drugs are plus there's all these other other things that are this is the synthetic wave of the opioid crisis now there's just all kinds of things that people don't know anymore what they're putting in themselves so being able to test is really important 
using smaller amounts of, of, of drugs if you're going to use them. Um, carrying Narcan, like we talked about all night, and then having people know to call 911 so you folks can get there and help them. Um, that's what that's what we're trying to do. And then if people come to our department and want help, if they want to get into treatment, we can do that. We can start people on medications in the department. We can link them to services. We're staffed 24 seven with people with lived experience that come in. They've been there before. Um, they're 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 an example of what happens when people, you know, want to get help. Um, it serves both not only to remind the people that are using drugs, but the people that take care of people are using drugs. That this is what it can look like. So um, I think it's really important to have these kind of forums where we come together and talk about it. Even if we're talking amongst ourselves, this is equally as important. People may be able to see this another time. We're going to do more of these. And you're going to do more of these now that you've signed up. So that's good. Yes. <laughs> but it's really important, you know, and, 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 and it's exactly what you said. It's like, you know, this, the, the, the fact that people use drugs has been going on for centuries, but it's not a family's problem. It's not Teresa's problem. It's not the hospital's problem. It's a community issue. And there's no way that we can do it in our little silos. We're going to work together as a community. So this is the crux of what it's about is little meetings like this that go a long way to get things done and get people the help they need. Absolutely. That's all. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so I think we can probably start wrapping up. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any more questions or comments? Hey there, I do. This is Alice Spirito. Hi, guys. Um, Hello. thank you so much for having this. And um, Teresa, you did great. I appreciate that story, and I'm sorry you went through that. Um, I actually kind of had a similar situation. I used to work at the hub in Berlin, the methadone cl um, clinic, and we very sadly lost a patient due to um, the family member not um, calling 911. So they used the Narcan, but it was and in, it was the, the the process was incomplete because they didn't understand or they were fearful of calling nine one one for their family member, and they went back down under in, into being uh, the overdose and then expired during the night. Uh, people went back to bed, and it happened like you know a few hours later. So, uh, I have a I have a couple questions, and one of them was, do you have a sense of um, the community having resistance to just like visual um, public health education, like the signage that I forget what the name of the agency is. The VDIC gave us at at our meetings some um, beautiful uh, posters for harm reduction, like never use alone, um, call 911. And I put some up and they were taken down the next day in, in downtown Barrie. That was one question. If you if you feel like there's just so much resistance um, driven by misunderstanding or not enough information or whatever it's driven by. And then my other question sort of related is, so we're doing these no box boxes now, which is really wonderfully presented like with the next to the AED machines. Um, and I'm thinking about, oh, these are gonna be, before I came to this meeting, I was visualizing that they were, um, you were gonna be talking about the vending machines, the naloxone, you know, vending machines that are being put up at universities and whatnot. What what does the community, like how, how <laughs> my question is, do you have a sense of you're gonna go slow with the public health education and how how much longer do would we need to wait for those kinds of things to be put up in public areas? The vending machine. It just it it might feel like overwhelming for some people who are resistant to it. And I I get I I'm just curious what your guys' thoughts are on the vending machines and visual, you know, visual aid, um, public health, you know, harm reduction information. Like what what do we need to do in our community? Um as proponents of harm reduction, and what your thoughts are on that? I mean, I, I think you're right, Alice. I mean, I, I think when I think about you know the reason that you know those posters come down or there's pushback is because of the stigma around drug use, and you know 
I don't know. I think Teresa taught me, I mean, the way to combat stigma is through education. I mean, the more education we can do, um, you know, the more this becomes acceptable practice. And I think that, you know, that's really important is that, you know, there should come a day where those posters don't come down. They should be, you know, everywhere. You walk into a, you know, a, a library, a store, they're there, just like the choking ones, right? Back when, you know, when people were learning the Heimlich maneuver, it's all, it's all just something that has to be educated. Um, and then, you know, when you get into things like Narcan distribution centers, you know, if you have an organization like a university that can, you know, provide that um, and, you know, again, like provide the infrastructure of filling them when they're empty, you know, educating students and people around it, you know, it, it takes, it does take infrastructure. I mean, I think that, you know, we have a lot of great ideas, but I, what I appreciate about this project is that, you know, Olivia and Eva realized, you know, when they started was that there was just a lot of misunderstanding and, and antiquated beliefs about all this. So they realized that by doing a survey, kind of seeing where the, where the public's at, right? We got to meet the public where they're at too, right? Mm -hmm. um, really gave a lot of information and then we can target, you know, education and hopefully, you know, things like this are really important. We have to keep doing them. You know, we have to get out in a, in a lot of communities. It takes time and it takes people that want to do it. But I think clearly the interest is there. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Could I, could I just and chime in real please. quick on something here, Allison? I know all of us have been, a lot of us have been doing this work for a long time. And I was just thinking back to, you know, the times before Nalox boxes were ever heard of, before we were doing recorded uh, community conversations where I was just going in, just me, just with a box of Narcan and talking to the Community Restorative Justice Center. And I was going to their residence houses and just doing quick and dirty, just like, this is what this does. This is how you use it. And I was giving them a, a you know, box of Narcan to keep and with the first aid kit at the house, you know, and, and the time of going to city council meetings where we were being voted, no, you can't bring a syringe service program into our town. Those days have changed, right? And so I have so much we're doing, we're do what we're doing right now is what how to get to that place. And I just I remember those days so well, fighting so hard to bring harm reduction services to places. And um we don't have to fight that hard anymore. And we see how far we've come. It's just amazing. Um, so have faith and hope. What we're 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 doing the right thing and we're, it's gonna keep growing. So but thanks for bringing it up. I thought I'd give a little boost of of the Thank old school. <laughs> may, may I ask a quick question? Um, I'm a, this has been helpful and I um, will go back and watch the video because unfortunately I couldn't start, uh, couldn't be here at the beginning, but um, on some levels, I'm a little sad that there's not more people here. <laughs> Actually on a lot of levels, I kind of expected a lot more people to be here and uh, it, I, I don't know, just in terms of getting the word out and things, I wonder if something like farmer's markets where people might be more amenable, just to even have like a, if they would let you do a booth, just to like an information booth, like maybe near it or outside it, just to, and something else that's just more passive where people could just stop by and say, oh yeah, I'm interested. I never really knew more about that. Or if that's like a later phase of things, um, because I think the more that it's normalized, as it already kind of is, but um anyway just i'm trying to think of other ways to get the word out i mean this seems pretty accessible because all i had to do is click a zoom link but clearly i think there's another step that people need to have in order to participate they probably think oh it's a great idea and then that's it <laughs> you know? so um i guess my question is how what else could people tangibly do to help get the word out about these things Yeah, well, that's such a good um, a good point that you're raising, and I think, and Rachel, before before we got started, said we should go to the grocery store and do this, which is similar to the farmers market idea. But I think that the point is, um, it's always hard to bring the public here to us. It's asking a lot. It's the evening. People have kids. Um, people have responsibilities. So I think. We should get creative with how we can go meet people where they are and do it. You know, it doesn't have to be an hour that you sit down. It can be shorter and um, easier than that. So it's like, it's a really good point. Um, 
even having like a, a handout that you give people and saying, here's a link to more information. Here's the video for people if you want to see what we've been doing recently, something like that. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, I feel like a lot of these recent questions are very related. And I agree, Melissa, going into a variety of public places, like I was sort of kidding when I said the grocery store, but I'm not kidding. I mean, I, and I think similarly to the presence of an Alox box is the work that we're doing is by putting this out there in the community, we are saying people who use drugs exist and they have a right to be in these spaces and they have a right to be here however they wish to be here. And we want to provide what we can be like providing to make sure they are safe or as safe as they wish to be. And so I think like it sounds strange, but in a way, these boxes are almost aesthetically pleasing, right? They are not big, scary things. And I think it says to people like, folks have a right to be however they are, and they have a right to be standing next to the cardiac patient too, right? Like these are all just ways humans show up. And so we should be at the grocery store. We should be next to the AED. We should be in the home. We should be here in the library. So yeah, I think there's like Alice and Melissa's questions are very intertwined in that way. Like we have to fight to show up. Folks have to sh like fight to show up every day, no matter who you are or what your life is about. Um, so if they take the posters down, we bring them back. You know, we get a friend and we have our friend do more too. Like we go to the pharmacy and we uh, secret shop for naloxone ourselves. And when we get it, we give it to our neighbors, stuff like that. So yeah, I think it's all so entwined but i think that yeah you just continue to put it out there and give it the beauty that it deserves so well said i also love the idea of the farmer's market too i could totally just see like waterbury i i feel like i saw i was born you know and at cbh and i've lived in waterbury my whole life I feel like I've gone to so many farmers markets and I've run into so many people and just seen people have random booths and you learn a lot of I don't know weird, funny, cool things there. And yeah. something like this, having someone go over it and then even just like an anonymous box where like here can you just select yes or no, like would you want this in the community? Yeah. You get a box of like, you know, oh, 50 people filled out and they all said yes. Like yeah. that's a good start. That's a pretty good group of people and I feel like the people who go to the farmer's market are pretty prominent in this community. I mean, they're the ones they go there to support, you know, the, their neighbors, the their friend who's up on stage playing the music at, you know, the uh the event, the concert in the park after the farmers market, you know. So I love that idea. So. I think that's a great idea. In my other my other hat that I wear is in suicide prevention and we're often at the farmer's market tabling and talk about a topic that people don't want to touch. <laughs> um, but I talk to people constantly throughout my time there, just one after another coming up and talking and sharing and being open and asking questions. And so I think if we can do it with that very heavy, uh, sort of scary topic, I think we can certainly do it with this. Yeah, I love that because not only would you have this box to be talking about your community project, but you could also tap Vermont Cares and make sure you had the personal carry supply mm -hmm. at that same table. You know, we could do do that together so people could not only hear about this and when they see this box, know what to do with it, but they could also leave with their personal carry at the same yeah. time and get a quick little tutorial at the table how to use it. I think there we could do so many, so, so many things, right? While we using this as a great launching point for the conversation too um because it's it's digestible it's it makes sense it's logical it, it people who aren't familiar with this can say oh yes i i know i've seen those aed you know boxes and and really understand that because the bottom line is we're all humans and we we naturally want to help other humans like that's just inherently who, who we are as beings um, and, and I don't think it's that hard of a, it's that hard of a sell. Um, but it does seem so, like, oh, the far, would we go to the farmer's market because of all that stigma that we've all been, it, you know, entrenched in for, you know, for so, 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 so long. Um, I love that. There's such a great idea. Yeah. I love farmer's markets. <laughs>
Yeah, so getting the word out even about how easy it is to use this, right? I'm, you know, as I'm just listening to the conversation, I'm wondering, like, how many people actually know that, right? I mean, this is, I mean, AEDs are pretty simple to use, but even those are, you know, we got to, like, open it up and you got to look at the, pet. I mean, this is, this is so simple, this yeah. is so easy to save a life with this, and it doesn't require a lot of training. It, you know, you put it in their nose and you push the button, wow. and, you know, most of the yeah. time that's going to save a life. Um, and it's so easy to do that, right? Like, to take the judgment out of it, but goodness yeah. gracious. When you, you think know, of each component we can, of we can all CPR, it's like, I mean, you yeah. need to start your compression, so you right. need to place the pads. Let's I mean, right and left. And so before that, yeah, you need to yeah. open it. Like, there's so many things. And this is, yeah, so you oh, yeah. open the package yeah. in the nose, push. push. And it's floating. So, right, you're not, uh, you're not got, right. Compared, yeah. yeah. Right. You can't, you can't basically, it answer answer right. basically yeah. you can't hurt somebody with it. Yeah. And don't forget, I have personal care. You know, I can't hear for anybody that wants to take that with them um, before you go. We'll make sure that we get that for you. Yeah, Melissa, we um, would love to connect with you if you'd like to receive some yourself. Um, we can easily make that happen. That would be great. I would, I would love to be part of it. Well, we're a little past 7 30. Do you want to close this out? Lindsay? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming tonight. It was, I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. And I hope that you all continue the awesome work you're doing. And, and maybe our next trainings will have some more community members. And so, yeah. So thank you all so much. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good have work, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Alice. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye.